Okay, I would like to welcome everybody, and I'd like to uh, invite you to uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council regular meeting for Monday, December 9th, 2013. And I, uh, I have a roll call called by the clerk. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McCausland? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Wagner? Councilor Walsh? Here. First order of business is the oath of office to be administered to the Cape Elizabeth School Board and then followed shortly thereafter by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. So I have Michael and Susanna, would you, would you join us up front here please and we'll have the clerk administer the oath of office. Thank you. <clears throat> front and center. There we go. Caitlin Jordan and uh, Martha McCausland, Molly. Either one. So my last official act as chairman of the town council, I get the privilege to take up item number one. And we're going to do that after the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> we'll all stand, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> I'm so anxious to pass the gavel. Um, first item on the agenda is the election of town council chair for the year 2014. And I would like to nominate Jessica Sullivan for chair for the town council year 2014. Do I hear a second? I would second that. Seconded motion. by David. Any discussion? All those in favor? It is unanimous. Congratulations. She has so much stuff over there, we need a moving truck. Yeah, that's there true.
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jim and fellow counselors. I've just got a couple things to say before we proceed. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I'd like to thank my fellow counselors for their support, their confidence, and their trust. I look forward to working with you, with the town manager and staff, towards our common goal, serving the citizens of our community to the very best of our abilities. And most of all, I look forward to hearing from you, our fellow citizens, as we live and work together in our beloved Cape Elizabeth. And now, I'd like to say a few words uh, in honor of Jim Walsh, who has been our chairman for 2013. I have a few things to say, and after that, I welcome all our fellow counselors to add to the accolades, as they, as they will. Jim was first elected to the council in 2009, along with Frank Governale and myself. From the beginning, his energy and enthusiasm were apparent. He rolled up his sleeves and immediately went to work. His mantras were, and have always been, how can we do this better? How can we get more people involved in discussion? How can we improve the process? In canvassing current and former counselors, there was universal recognition of Jim's overriding achievements as a counselor and as chairman, his efforts in engaging the public, our citizens. He spearheaded communication policies, which we now follow, and which have affected all areas of council activity. Most importantly, he created more opportunities for public input and has been recognized for these efforts by the Greater Portland Council of Governments. As a liaison to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, Bill Nickerson told me Jim has been incredibly valuable as a, as a uh, guide, very supportive, giving solid help and guidance during the master plan process update when many first-time changes developed, such as food vendors and commercial bus fees. As chairman of the Ordinance Committee, he spent countless hours communicating with citizens and in guiding the development of the town's first short-term rental ordinance. More specifically, as 2013 chairman, Jim has moved a stalled Thomas Memorial Library project forward with the Library Planning Committee. He's kept us all focused on and responsible for our various tasks and committee work. Frank Governale pointed out that one of Jim's strengths as chairman was helping fellow counselors keep on task to accomplish our goals. With Frank's work as finance chair, this has resulted in our new long-term capital improvement plan. Jim has been a dynamic chairman. He has the ability as a leader to understand many points of view to ask the tough questions, to provide laser focus on what needs to be done, and how to best find collaborative ways to achieve results or consensus. His credibility with fellow counselors has been outstanding. No one works harder than Jim does to understand issues and work towards solutions, and to support fellow counselors who need help with an issue. His wife, Kathy, who I have consulted, <laughs> thinks, thinks of him as a catalyst, which the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines as a person or event that causes change or action. Jim has most definitely been a catalyst for positive change in Cape Elizabeth. And as such, his hard work has been directly responsible for some notable firsts, which have made our town government and its process more responsive and transparent to our citizens. Many thanks, Jim. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? And, we ha and after you do, we have a little presentation. <clears throat> Dave, Council uh, Chairman, I should say. <laughs> I uh, didn't prepare any remarks, Jim but it has been a real pleasure being on the council with you and getting to know you over the past four or five, four, I don't know, I'm losing track, you're years. In, you're in your last year, so uh, it's five. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, I, I, when I was asked what, what I think was your major accomplishment, <laughs> it, it comes back to a theme that Jessica has already raised, which is uh, trying to improve the process with how, and how we make decisions and how to improve or increase uh, public participation. And I think as a result, when we get to these settings tonight, for example, mm -hmm. we have already heard from citizens on numerous occasions and are feeling fully informed as to their points of view. 
Uh, so for that, I thank you. I thank you for your leadership and your friendship on the council. And uh, I'm glad I'll still have, I'll have you here on my right-hand side now for the Great. coming year. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Wagner. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank Jim for his focus on transparency. It's a very important issue to me. And I know that you've been a great steward of that. Um, I also appreciate your efforts for efficiencies in municipal government. And thank you. you pay a lot of attention to that. And it's, it, it's great for the taxpayers. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Appreciate it. Council Ray. Just wanted to thank Jim for his leadership and his very hard work this past year and his commitment to Cape Elizabeth, as I know he's very committed. And um, so thank you very much, Jim. Good, thank you. Appreciate it. Councilor Jordan. I covered most of it, so. <laughs> I mean, you've done such a great job, and I mean, it's not like we have to give a farewell. We get to no, no, have I, your, I we get to have, no, you know, your presence years. for, yeah. yes, going forward. So thank great. you. Thank you. Good. Okay. <laughs> and Councilor McCausland. Thank you. Yes, and thank you too, Jim, for all of your support for the library project and your interest in the project over the last year. And I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Can I say something? Please. <laughs> Again, I, I, you know, I really thank you very much. I mean, these are, uh, it's very humbling to, to hear what folks feel about the work that, uh, that I really enjoy doing and, and for the good of uh, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. But I also think it's important to highlight that you have in the case of the seven councilors here and also our town manager and our, our, our you know, town clerk and Frank Avanelli who just left the council, you have people who, have, who really have a passion for Cape Elizabeth, for, for the community we live in, to continue to make it a great place to work and live and bring our families up. So, you know, I, I feel privileged to be part of that. In some small way, you know, we're going to make our contributions and we're going to move on. But I think that in, in the interim, I feel that the citizens of Cape Elizabeth are very, very lucky to have people who care, as all of you do, because that's what makes the difference and that's what makes doing the things that we do as elected officials worthwhile. Because I'm going to say this blunt to those of you in the audience. This is the most thankless job that anyone could ever ask. If you read our emails in the last four hours, you would ask yourselves, why the hell are we doing this? Um, it's not an easy job. Um, but you've got to be, as, as you stated, somewhat laser focused on what the end game is, weighing out all the issues, trying to be fact based in how you make your decisions and hope that you're doing the right thing. And we've had a lot of folks who have gone before us on this council who've done incredible things, which is why we all enjoy the community we live in. And the last person I want to thank is, is uh, Mike McGovern. Mike has been um, a mentor. He's been um, a soothsayer. He's, to some degree, been the sage. Uh, he's been the, uh, the moral compass. Um, we've also been that for him. Uh, but I think that the long and short of it is we are very lucky to have a manager who approaches his work with the same level of passion and understanding and focus that those of us that are on the council um, use on a daily basis. Um, we don't necessarily always agree, and that's important for the community to realize. I think that Mike and I have described our relationship as somewhat love-hate. Um, that's okay, because I think from that discord or discussion, comes good because we push back at each other and push each other to get what's right for the town and what's right for our council in terms of our direction. So, so I, I thank all of you. Um, I appreciate your uh, at being colleagues and I appreciate the, the work that we're going to in, undertake in this next year under your leadership, Jessica. And um, whatever I can do to make that a, a smooth and, and successful year um, here, I'm all in. Thank you. Jim, we'd like to give you this gift as thanks for your year as chairman. Thank you.
Okay, it's a clock with the town seal, and it basically talks to James T. Walsh, the town council chairman, 2013. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I have to use this tonight. <laughs> well, I've got my timer on my iPhone. Um, are there any town council reports and correspondence? Uh, council Wagner? David Sherman and I um, attended today's Town Center Planning Committee meeting, Maureen and our other members. Um, we, uh, I think we have an agenda item tonight about yes. extending the uh, time period for the deliberations of that committee. Mm -hmm. um, and we are continuing to deliberate. So uh, we, we, I think Dave and I both support additional time and would ask that the council grant that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Do we have a finance committee report? Uh, I, I don't think uh, so. We don't have a finance committee at the moment. <laughs> All right, moving on. This is an opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. Do we have anyone wishing to address the council for anything not on tonight's agenda? No. Can we have the town manager's report, please? Thank you, Chairman Sullivan. I think there's not much that isn't on the agenda this evening, so I can understand the reticent to speak, uh, reticence in speaking. I, I just want to uh, say a, a, one word on Jim. Yeah, I, th I think that a, a testimony to Jim is when you look at the council goals that were developed when he became the chair of the council. And I don't think there's ever been a council with his leadership that's been more focused on their goals. And, you know, all kidding, we, we, in large part, we have a 33-item agenda this evening because Jim kept us early getting things done, but he also made sure the goals that weren't quite done got done. And, uh, you know, I just think it, it shows his excellent leadership, and it was a, it was a great uh, honor to work with him. And uh, I'll still get a lot of phone calls, I'm sure, and I'll look forward to those. So thanks, Jim. The other thing I wanted to do uh, tonight, and I, I usually don't give much of a manager's report on, on nights when there's a long agenda, but tonight I wanted to, to do it a little bit, and it'll take a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, I think, it, particularly as we look at this library project that's on the council agenda this evening, I think it's, it's good to have a historical perspective at, at past projects where we stand. And the last really significant project we had was the Cape Elizabeth Police Station. And it, it's something oft commented upon. But I think, you know, sometimes it, it, people just see it there. And I, I think maybe we've lost the context of how it came about. And, uh, and I think it's instructive for as we, as we look at other projects. The building's actually been open uh, since May of 2002. Uh, for those that don't remember, before then there was a police and fire station on the same site that was built in the 50s. Uh, it was actually authorized by unanimous vote of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council with none of the current council members present uh, on the council then in November of 2000. So the vote to approve it now was uh, a full 13 years ago. The full cost of the building was under $2.2 million. Sometimes I hear that it costs $4 million. Some other numbers, I don't know where those numbers come from, but it's $2.2 million. Primary funding came from a bond issue that was issued in 2001, which interestingly also funded the purchase of the community center property for $560,000, the renovation of the former public works garage into the town center fire station at a cost of about $1.1 million, a $150,000 contribution towards school playgrounds, and 250000 in funding for the town's contribution to the, toward the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust acquisition of Robinson Woods. I mention that because, you know, there's also the schools are looking at some roof needs and other issues, and there are, there's past precedent of, precedents of taking needs together and actually encompassing them with one borrowing at the same time. Interestingly enough, on the evening the bond issue for the police station was approved, that was the major piece in it, 14 citizens spoke that night in opposition to the acquisition of the community center property. No one spoke against the police or fire stations or commented on the playgrounds or the contribution for the land trust. Uh, the minutes of the meeting, and you can look, check this out, the minutes can be found on our website. The concept plan for the police and fire station was, at, was approved, though, by a 5-2 council vote 15 years ago this week. Uh, the, the concept was approved. 
uh, that had originally come from a, the recommendation from a facilities 2000 committee that was established at the very beginning of 1998. To give a sense of how the police station compares to other projects in the same era, the renovation of the Donald Richards pool was about a half million dollars more than the cost of the police station. The acquisition of the, of the community center and its renovation was about 100,000 more than the police station. The public works garage and the construction of the various ball fields at Gullcrest was 1.5 million more than the police station. And the, the, the renovated fire station here in the town center, which had been a public works garage, was about 1.1 million less than the police station. If you look at all the major projects the town undertook during that era, uh, other than school renovations, it, this is between 97 and 2002, the total cost was just over $13 million, a lot of money. The police station cost was 17% of that amount. Uh, municipal debt owed before all these projects began was about $3 million. Uh, it eventually went up to about $14 million. Uh, and then today it's $6.5 million. We're retiring about $800,000 worth of municipal debt each year. It, as, I, as I mentioned, this is the 15th anniversary of when the concept for the police station was approved. And I think everyone knows much has changed over the last 15 years. Dispatching was consolidated into Portland. A regional crime lab was established. Animal control was contracted to South Portland. But still today, the building houses space for our police officers, offices for the police chief, the police captain, the detective, the community liaison officer, the part-time emergency management director, and a regional domestic violence counselor uh, that we have working uh, through us through family uh, services. Uh, there were also two rooms in the police station dedicated to secure evidence storage. There's space for the department clerk. Uh, there's a storage rooms for bikes, tires, records, and all the other stuff that police departments use. There's two small meeting rooms, there's two small interview rooms, and there's, there's a small exercise area. Because of the changes that I mentioned, about 15% of the building, which is 9,400 square feet, could be freed up for non-police purposes. It's possible that some of the space may be utilized for temporary purposes while a new library is under construction, such as for the storage of historical records or for back office uh, library operations or even for storage of part of the library collection. Uh, but however the surplus space is utilized in the short term and long term, it is important that we first segregate it for security and privacy purposes away from the core police functions. You know, there, there are many stories around town about the police station and its cost, which, which I mentioned are usually inflated. There's also, I think, you know, not too much understanding on the, on the actual uses of the building and who, who actually works in there. So on, on the 15th anniversary of the, con of the approval of the concept for the building, and nearly, in after nearly 12 years of operation, I really think it's a good time to appreciate the significant asset that we have in this building, both as a police station and a building that part of its use can be repurposed for other purposes in the future. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have a review of draft minutes. It's not an item number, but... Don't we need to vote and approve those? We do. Okay. Draft minutes of November 6. Do I have a motion to review, to uh, approve the minutes of November 6, 2013? So moved. Councilor Sherman, do I have a second? Second. Councilor Ray, is there any discussion? No? I have a question. Can I vote? Yes. 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 You may vote. All those in favor? Opposed? There's no, that was unanimous. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do I have a motion to approve the November 13, 2013 minutes? So Councillor Walsh, a second. Councillor McCausland, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. <clears throat> Item two: Adoption of Town Council rules. Um, the rules are the same as last year, except they now include the underlying text below. Um, is there, we've all seen these. Is there a, do I have a motion to approve item number two? Councilor Sherman. Uh, I move that we adopt the town council rules, uh, specifically the change in section two relating to workshop meetings, which would allow the council to vote on procedural motions, uh, to determine a conflict of interest, to enter into an executive session, or to adjourn. I have a second. Second. Is there any discussion? 
All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Item number three, appointment of the Finance Committee. Uh, the item reads that to uh, approve James Walsh as chairman of the Finance Committee and the council as a whole uh, as to become the Finance Committee, which is the usual practice. Do, I, do we have a motion for item number three? Councilor Sherman? Uh, so moved. <laughs> Second. Councilor Wagner, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number four, appointment of an ordinance committee. It's proposed that Councilor Ray serve again as chairman and that Councilors Walsh and Wagner be members of the ordinance committee. Is there a motion? Councilor McCausland moves. So moved. And the second? Second. Councilor Sherman, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Um, items 6 uh, through 17, I believe. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm in, it's number 5. Sorry about that. Item number 5, appointment of an appointments committee. <laughs> um, it is uh, uh, su suggested that Ka uh, Caitlin Jordan, Councilor Jordan, be chairman with Councilors McCausland and Sherman be the, member, the other members of the appointments committee. Is there a motion? Uh, so moved. Councilor Sherman, second. second. Councilor Ray, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. And now, uh, Councilor, uh, items numbers, numbers 6 through 17 will be considered as a block. Does any councilor wish to remove any item from the consent list? No. Okay. Is there a motion to consider items numbers 6 through 17 as a block? Councilor Walsh? I move that we consider items 6 through 17 as a block. Is there a second? Councilor Ray? All those in favor? A discussion. Sorry. Any discussion? Uh, you might, can you explain to the audience why, um, what we, where did this come from? I mean, it just. Certainly. So they understand this. <laughs> no. We have 17, uh, six, items 6 through 17 are procedural items that that formally appoint various councillors as, as liaisons and members of other committees in the community. Um, these have all been agreed on uh, by consensus at a workshop, but we formally vote these in tonight. And there's just a long list. So to, to in, 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 uh, in an effort to save time on all parts, we, we usually consider these in one block that rather than going through each one individually. Okay. And did we, all those in favor? <laughs> so it's unanimous. Okay. All right, now where are we? So we're now ready for the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Technically, they just voted the procedure in order to have it on block, so they need to vote on the other side. Ah, okay. The uh, manager has informed me. We just voted, we just technically voted to, to vote these on block, but now we have to actually approve the appointments. So could I have a motion? Councilor yeah, Sherman. I move that we approve the appointments listed in items 6 through 17. Seconded. And Council Walsh seconded. And all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> the next item is our public hearing. We'll now have a public hearing. Um, and before we open the public hearing, uh, would Councilor Ray, who is the chairman of the Ordinance Committee, please just give us a brief explanation of item 18, proposed amendments to the sign ordinance. Sure. Um, the Ordinance Committee met, and I think we um, also proposed to the Town Council, but um, there's a change, a change in the ordinance which came about from about five business members, oh, thank you, five business members coming to us and um, asking for a change in the sign ordinance. Um, currently, the sign ordinance is a 30-day uh, block, which can be for three months at a time. Um, and so what we have done is we've uh, made some changes. We've also made some changes in definitions. 
Um, there's a change in open flag definition, which um, is basically what it sounds like. They, businesses can have a flag that says open. Um, a sandwich board sign, again, um, the definition. Uh, changes in some zoning, um, uh, changes in location, um, that, um, and, and it comes back down to that one sandwich board is allowed per business establishment. Um, when there's multiple businesses that share the same property, each business establishment shall be allowed one sandwich board. Um, the sandwich board can be limited, is limited to a maximum gross area of 12 square feet per side and a maximum height of four feet. Um, it will be located on the property where the business is located, but may be located in the right of way adjacent to the property. It shall be only displayed during business hours, shall be weighted or secured to avoid being carried away by wind, um, and it shall be not independently illuminated. And the most important piece is that it now can be there for a 12-month period, so um, on an annual piece. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody else in the Ordinance Committee wanted to add anything or missed anything. So. Um, Okay. Before we begin the public hearing on the sign ordinance, I'd just like to remind everyone that we do have uh, policies of decorum, so please do not applaud or make comments about any citizens' uh, concerns as they express them. We always welcome uh, thoughts from our citizens. So with that having been said, we'll now open the public hearing. Does anyone wish to address the Town Council for the, uh, the pending sign ordinance? Amendment. Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Do I have a motion to adopt the proposed amendments to the sign ordinance? Councilor Ray. I move that we approve the proposed amendments to the sign ordinance per items 18-2014. A second? I'll second the motion. Councilor Sherman. Is there any discussion? Council Wagner. Sure. Yeah, the only thing that jumped out at me was that the ordinance is drafted has the sign only being displayed during the hours of business operation. And I know that in the practice of a lot of businesses, they don't typically take down their sandwich board during closed business hours. So I think that'd be a departure from what the, at least the practice is for some of these businesses. I, I was thinking the same doing? thing. Um, several businesses like to advertise specials, you know, well, they're closed. I mean, that's to grab attention. So I had the same thought. Yeah. Councilor Sherman? Uh, I was on the ordinance committee as we considered this, and, and that was not a sentiment that we heard any business owner express to us during our deliberations. Uh, I think the rationale for doing this was that the sandwich board signs uh, are mobile, can be knocked over, et cetera, and the idea was we didn't want them to be in or near public ways or sidewalks. Uh, after the business closed. Uh, so that, that was the rationale, is that they, when the, it, it, they're really, like, from our standpoint, were designed to, to promote the business while it was being operated, to advertise specials, et cetera. So we just didn't consider, we didn't consider uh, after hours uh, signage. Councilor Ray? Um, I would um, concur with Councilor Sherman, and um, none of the businesses had asked for that, but uh, there was one business owner that suggested, too, that they do take them down because they're um, concerned about um, having them stolen, um, vandalized, that kind of thing. So one of the reasons that we agreed with, um, you know, during open business hours. Councillor Walsh. Uh, just a, I want to highlight the fact this is a, this is a prime example, of this sign ordinance and this change on how government has responded to citizens and business folks here in town. I mean, this, this really came from a couple of business owners who were not happy with the way the sign ordinance was, was originally stated. It became a bit of a burden and brought it to our attention and, uh, and the ordinance committee took it up and uh, came up with something that I think with their involvement, frankly, is a solution that I think will work for everybody. And again, like everything with our government, if it doesn't work, we'll certainly come back and look at it and make sure it works. So my hat's off to the Ordinance Committee for your openness and willingness to accept the, the feedback from the community. Councilor Sherman? This isn't the most 
significant ordinance change we've dealt with in, lot, in the last few years, but it was important to these business owners. Uh, I think under the prior ordinance, the sandwich board could only be utilized for a three month mm -hmm. period. Okay. So this allows them to be used year long. Again, not a huge issue for your average citizen, but to these business owners, it was very important. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Um, is there any other discussion? Any? Shall Shall we have a vote on the amendment? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. And we'll now start the public hearing on, an up, on the update to the Greenbelt Plan. And before we open the public hearing, let me again state that we welcome our citizens' comments. Please do not applause or make any comments on what is being said at the podium. Um, each uh, individual will try to limit to three minutes. Please, it would be very helpful if you could stand up sort of in line if they're assuming there are a number of you who want to speak to this. This will help the evening move along. Um, uh, so anyway, okay. Public hearing is now open. Oh, please come ahead. Yep, come ahead. And I, I, I forgot something. I'll, let me mention that. Um, with us tonight, if you'll just, just a moment, um, is uh, Derwood Parkinson who is uh, an attorney in Bergen Parkinson who has advised the council on uh, the Greenbelt plan. And uh, we're, we uh, welcome him here tonight. He's here to listen and take notes. And then we thank him for his services. So. Yeah. OK, <laughs> let's go ahead. Good evening. I'm Marty Blair. And I'm in my second three-year term as a conservation commissioner appointed by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, and I live in the Oakhurst area. I'd like to talk to you about why the Greenbelt Plan is important to the town of Cape Elizabeth. First, the plan provides a context within which the town council can make decisions regarding open space and its uses. For example, seeking or granting easements, applying for grant funding, and accepting donations. These decisions are all made by the council with input from the Conservation Commission, among others. Second, the Greenbelt Plan is used in subdivision review and resource protection permit applications, on which the Conservation Commission is required by ordinance to advise the planning board. Third, it guides the Conservation Commission. And I'll give you uh, some more specific examples in a minute. But one is, example is that it gives the Conservation Commission a source of potential projects when a volunteer approaches us. We've supported several Eagle Scout initiatives, and we're proud to say that the scouts who have worked with us have all been granted their highest award in scouting. These three uses for the Greenbelt Plan show that the plan impacts the decision making of you, the council, also the planning board, and the Conservation Commission. As well, it is relied on by the town manager, the town planner, and the public works department. The commission needs the type of guidance provided by the Greenbelt Plan because of who we are, but also because of who we are not. We are an advisory committee to the town council appointed by the town council. We are a public body, and as such, our deliberations and documentation are open to the public, as guided by you. We make recommendations to the council, and we are bound by your guidelines regarding transparency. Just as important with regard to the Greenbelt Plan is who we are not. We're not empowered to negotiate financial deals with landowners. We're not empowered to sign contracts or other legal documents. We are not able to adopt ordinances, and we are not supervisors to town em uh, employees. So we rely heavily on the Greenbelt Plan as a guiding document to our efforts. The Town Council, through Article 5 of the Ordinance, has charged the Commission with stewardship of open space. Therefore, stewardship is one of the primary goals of our proposed 2013 Greenbelt Plan. 
In keeping with the goal of stewardship, last year we developed and submitted to the Council for approval this open space and greenbelt maintenance plan which includes an inventory of all town properties, their intended uses, and how they should be maintained for those uses. We also have developed specific management plans for Winnick Woods and for Gullcrest. We recently have been meeting with the South Portland Conservation Commission for the first time in a collaborative initiative to restore Trout Brook, which is now considered an urban impaired stream. This initiative involves applying for grants, meeting with the butters, coordinating volunteer efforts, and working with public utility company as well as private landowners. If you could finish up. Okay. Um, these are all specific examples of how the Greenbelt Plan informs our stewardship efforts, which are required by council. Um, education is the second overarching goal, and the third is expansion and connectivity. I'd like to refer you to the plan itself for um, the criteria that we use. And in closing, I'd like to say that the stated vision of the Greenbelt Plan for Cape Elizabeth is to preserve open space, maintain the town's rural character, preserve wildlife habitat, and create opportunities for residents to enjoy a town-wide trail system which connects open space. I think the draft 2013 plan admirably serves that vision. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss it with you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the council on the Greenbelt Plan? And, and if you wouldn't mind standing up, that will help us save time. <laughs> Your name and address, please. My name is Connie Pacillo. I live at Three Reef Road. And I was going to say in Cape Elizabeth, but I think that's a given. <laughs> um, Jody Bro, who lives at 5 Wombeck Road, can't be with us tonight, but she asked that I read this letter uh, that she um, crafted to Cape Elizabeth Town Council members. As a frequent user of the Cape Elizabeth Greenbelt Trails, I'm writing in support of the Conservation Commission's 2013 Greenbelt Plan. I have followed the planning process from the first public forum through to your receiving of the plan. From my perspective, the Conservation Commission members have listened to many residents and have carefully created a sound plan for Cape Elizabeth. In particular, I wish to express support for Trail 23, and in prior documents or in prior discussions, it was called Trail 26, um, and that's just for your um, information. As you probably know, we have petitions that were um, signed with the, the um, Trail 26 mentioned. From a lengthy, thorough review of the Conservation Commission's communication folder, I found I am not alone in the support of this trail. The contents of the communication folder reveals 321 residents of Cape Elizabeth expressed their support for Trail 23 by signing petitions. An additional 21 residents of Cape Elizabeth submitted letters of support for Trail Number 23. Also, the contents of the Conservation Commission's communication folder reveals 64 residents opposed Trail 23 on Surfside Avenue. This is a 5 to 1 ratio in favor of Trail 23 on Surfside, which is known as a paper street. Based on the overwhelming support of the 2013 Greenbelt Plan, in particular Trail Number 23, it is my hope that you will listen to the majority of your constituents. Please approve the 2013 Greenbelt Plan as written. Sincerely, Jody Bro, 5 Wombeck Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. And Councillor Sullivan, do I have any more time? You have one minute. All right. Um, one of the things that was pointed out last time that we had um, a council meeting that, where this was discussed was that this is a neighborhood issue. This is bigger than a neighborhood issue. This is a community issue. This is a, um, the, the property in question is a paper street. I live near a paper street that is now being, um, across the street from me, is being developed. There's uh, the street that I abut and then across the street, which you all are familiar with, it used to be Elizabeth Road, and that is being developed and may indeed have actual traffic as a real um, public street. So I understand the concerns of those who abut Surfside. Uh, I knew what the concerns were when I purchased my property. It was in my deed, so I was clear on what I was getting into. And I think that um, this uh, Surfside Avenue 
the inception uh, of the beginning in the early 1900s was that it was for public enjoyment and that's why it remains so today. Ooh, I'm getting the hook. Well, thank you very much and I appreciate the opportunity to address you. Maynard Murphy, 24 Pilot Point Road. And I have with me a letter from a Cape resident who is unable to attend tonight. And his name is Joseph Guglielmetti, and he lives at 12 Old Fort Road. This is a letter that was sent to the town council members on Monday, November 25th. All. I would like to add a few comments to be added for consideration at the December 9 public hearing concerning the Greenbelt Plan. First and foremost, I want to thank all the folks that have worked on the Greenbelt system of trails, which I use regularly. The Greenbelt system offers varied terrain and visual variety, which is unmatched in smaller communities the size of Cape Elizabeth. I have had the good fortune of, to live in many small villages, Hanover, New Hampshire, Stowe, Vermont, Woodstock, New York, Cohasset, Massachusetts. And the Cape has by far the most extensive natural trail system of all. In my estimation, it can be made even better with the addition of the Shore Acres Coastal Trail. With the exception of a few scenic viewpoints, Fort Williams, Pond Cove, Cape Elizabeth offers very few, uh, offers very uh, few panoramic views of our most important visual stimulus, which is the Atlantic, that are free to its citizens. The push for oceanfront development as seen moving north from Massachusetts, involves tightly packed neighborhoods like Higgins Beach that totally hamper and eliminate public access to the ocean. This brings me to the touchy Shore Acres proposition. I can fully understand the position that the folks of the folks that live there and their desire to maintain their private view of the ocean, which in my opinion is valid if indeed they did not have a paper street clause that runs along their property. It is my belief that any realty title search should have noted the fact that the Paper Street designation would apply to the property for town planning purpose and those residents affected should have known that the potential for town use was a distinct possibility. The whole question will be heavily weighted by the legal aspects of the issue. I am not knowledgeable about paper trail legalities and I don't know if the properties affected have had tax variances in their favor, i.e. For, the for, the for the portion of the land that is designated a paper trail. If indeed they do, I think that the town has the right to allow the discrete development of trails that would benefit all the citizens of the town. Assuming the findings are favorable to the town, I would be in favor of adding this important Atlantic View Trail to the town's catalog of Greenbelt trails and to help establish scenic windows of our most important visual asset, the Atlantic, for future gen generations. Thank you. And again, that was from Joseph Guglielmetti of 12 Old Fort Road. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I just want to thank the Town Council and the Conservation Committee for working on this very um, challenging project. My name is Sue Murray Garrett. I live at 2 Katahdin Road in Cape Elizabeth. I have been a lifelong resident for 50 years in the town and I support wholeheartedly this proposition for one reason and one reason only because my father was in your position in 1964. He was a selectman for the town of Cape Elizabeth. His name was James Murray. And his choice was to either purchase Fort Williams or sell it to the university system for a lot of money. He was forward thinking, not about his generation, but about my generation and the next generation. This last piece of trail encompasses the last bit of shorefront property that is the right of every citizen in this community. I ask that the council continues with the vision of the conservation committee and forward think not for this generation, not for this moment, but what Fort Williams has done for our community and what the Greenbelt Trail, specifically this proposal, would do for future generations. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Seeing no one uh, at the microphone, I'm... Nope. <laughs> 
Oh, okay. Line up, folks. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I would like to read my your, name is your Deborah name Murphy. and address, please. Yeah, Deborah Murphy, and I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. I have a letter from a neighbor who can't be here because she's in Africa with her daughter. Um, and her name is Sheila Mayberry, and she resides at 30 Trendy Road. And could you repeat that, please? Uh, Sheila Mayberry, uh -huh. and her address is 30 Trendy Road. Dear members of the Town Council, I am writing this note because I will not be able to attend the Town Council meeting on Monday. I am in Botswana, Africa, visiting my daughter. Today we are in, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce all these, Medikwi, one of the largest protected game reserves in South Africa. South Africa has done an amazing job in protecting its natural resources. As you consider your decision to approve the Greenbelt Plan, I hope it includes a discussion of preserving Surfside Avenue, one of Cape Elizabeth's most beautiful natural resources. It is you who have the power to protect it. I will even go so far to say that it is within your fiduciary duty to protect it. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration of this difficult decision ahead of you. Sincerely, Sheila Mayberry. Thank you. And I had written some notes um, that I would like to share, too. Um, thank you very much, Town Council, and to the Conservation Commission for all your good and thoughtful work on behalf of Cape citizens and the greater good. I wholeheartedly support Trail Number 23, Surfside Avenue, Coastal Greenbelt Trail to remain in the Greenbelt Plan, and to remain as a paper street until 2037 or until acceptance from the town as a Greenbelt Trail which I hope to be the case, as Surfside Avenue was meant to be shared upon inception. The founders of the Shore Acres Land Company set this beautiful piece of property aside for all to enjoy in the spirit of a sharing community. There was in the design of Shore Acres the premise that exclusivity to the shorefront would not be allowed. When I moved to the neighborhood, my neighbors, who had been there for quite some time, took it upon themselves to educate me on my rights of Surfside Avenue, and they told me to walk it and protect it now and forever. Therefore, it's, it is difficult for me and others to understand why the people who purchase property abutting Surfside Avenue want to create exclusivity where it is never and should never exist. Surfside Avenue is a paper street, and the town continues to have public rights to it. Thanks to the fact that our town officials had the foresight to protect Surfside Avenue from being vacated by Maine State Statute Title 23, Section 3032, Subsection 1A, and they did so by filing a notice of exception in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds on September 11, 1997. This is allowed by, by the Maine State Statute Title 23, same section 3032, but Subsection 2 in Title Extensions. And here is the order from the town of Cape Elizabeth that um, uh, preserved the right. And in it, it says, um, whereas some proposed unaccepted ways may have public benefit to the town, either as public ways, pedestrian easements, utilities, or for other purposes in the future, the extent of which is difficult to determine. Thank you. So, thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Steer. I live at 9 Rockcrest Road. I wasn't planning to speak tonight because I had the impression that this item was going to be tabled. And I think that, that there was some confusion, at the very least, in the way the agenda set forth this point. But um, be that as it may, I'd just like to make a few comments in response to those you've heard so far. First. I hope the council won't put too much weight in the number of people who sign petitions. Um, it's easy for people to show up at the dump on a Saturday morning and go up to neighbors and ask them to sign things and present one point of view on an issue and then gather signatures without them really meaning a whole lot. 
And so I suggest to you that that's not the way we decide these kinds of issues. The second point I'd like to make is for the talk about preserving access to the ocean. Uh, it's very important. We all want to preserve access to the ocean, but, but what I think needs to be fundamentally clear here is that for every resident of Shore Acres, they already enjoy access to the ocean. And you can walk through that community on the streets that are now there without disturbing anybody's private property or anybody's privacy, and you can get extraordinary views of our oceanscape. So it's not necessary to do what, what the town has been asked to do, that is to put in Trail 23 to obtain ocean views. Um, but the, the fundamental point that I think we need to make is that, and this, this may have been overshadowed by talk of litigation, and, I, and I, I don't think the council should be influenced by litigation. What, what the council should be influenced by is whether the town enjoys the right to do what certain people want to do. And in this instance, the question is whether the town even has the right to accept a paper street that was shown in a plan filed in 1911 where nothing has happened to that property in over a hundred years. And even if the town has that right, there is a fundamental question going even further about whether the town can accept as something other than a public way a paper street. Well, these are difficult issues and there are reasons. There's the reason that the, the paper street was on the plan as it was originally shown. If you could finish up. Um, and, and I submit to you, it wasn't to preserve access to the ocean for all the residents. It was to preserve access to the lots as they were originally envisioned in Shore Acres. And that has changed over time. And for that reason, there has been no need to provide that access with a public way. And providing a public way now is something that no one, no one is advocating. Thank you. George Foley, 9 Pilot Point Road. Uh, I would like to make the point that seems to be overlooked here is um, a lot of people are saying that we're infringing on the uh, people who live there, their rights and so on. This property does not belong to those people. This property really belongs to the town. Their property line ends at the edge of Surfside Avenue, of which this is. It goes all the way around. Okay? So we're not taking from anyone. We're not, um, I mean, they knew that their property went so far. It would be like my saying, okay, gee, I don't like um, in front of my house on Pilot Point Road there. I don't think people should walk across there. It's a town road. Okay? It's the same thing down here. This is town land. It's not part of these abutters. They're trying to take it and extend their property out. They get a discount already. I think it's around 5% on their property tax because they don't have oceanfront property because this road is between them and the ocean. So this is not a taking. It's, it's a road that the town has and they have the rights to it. I mean, we've been here since 64. Everybody has known that this has been down there. We've played down there for years. We've walked it for years. Um, you know, it, I don't understand what the big issue is. This is a great place to put a trail where we have access to look and see the, the boats going by, the lobstermen out there. It's a great asset to Cape Elizabeth. I hope you'll keep that on the plan and develop it. Thank you.
Hi, Mike Duddy, 11 Crescent View Avenue. Uh, I served on the Conservation Commission for 10 years from 2001 to 2011. In that span of time, I had a hand in helping to draft the current Greenbelt Plan, uh, the Winnick Woods Master Plan, the Gullcrest Master Plan, the Open Space and Greenbelt Management Plan, um, and also had a hand in personally laying out, constructing, maintaining, or improving um, probably every Greenbelt trail in town. Um, I speak to you to provide some continuity from the current uh, Greenbelt Commission, uh, uh, from the past to the current Greenbelt Commission, and urge you to adopt the uh, current plan as drafted. I think it's a wonderful document. Um, I want to emphasize two aspects of the plan I think are particularly um, good and helpful. One is the statement of goals and objectives on pages um, 11, 12, 13, 14. Um, when I first joined the commission, the uh, basic vision and objective was to have one walking path that connected uh, Crescent Beach with Fort, F Fort Williams. When we updated the plan, um, the current plan, we decided uh, it was time to move to more of a hub and spoke kind of concept where it was not one, plan, uh, one path, but a path connecting various parts of town. And if you look at those goals and objectives, I think it's the next logical evolution that is no longer to be anchored to a single path or even a hub and spoke kind of concept, but looking more generally at how the trails meet the needs of the various parts of town is the way to go, from long distance walking trails to water views to all the, uh, the, the, uh, the goals and objectives stated. I think that's a nice evolution of the plan. Uh, the second thing I think is uh, critically important is the potential trails map. Now, tonight's public hearing is not about the Shore Acres Trail per se or any specific trail. Uh, when we adopted uh, the existing plan, we also had a potential trails map plan. Some po folks didn't like some of the trails on the plan, didn't like them being listed, but the document did a great thing. First off, it provided tremendous public transparency so that everybody knew what the conversation was and there were no backroom discussions about this, that, or the other trail. Um, secondly, it provided a nice opportunity for people in the town to be assured that private property rights were being respected because then, as now, generated a lot of discussion. There was a lot of language in the plan talking about the importance of private property rights. I think a, the inclusion of a potential trails map, even with trails that certain folks don't want to have appear on there, are a public service and a public protection for everybody. Uh, so thank you uh, for all the public comments. Thanks to the current uh, Conservation Commission. I hope you adopt the plan as is. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Barbara Freeman. I live at 22 Pilot Point Road. One of the earlier speakers tonight mentioned that we shouldn't really take too seriously signatures gathered at the recycling center. I'm not sure what voices you listen to, but I came out tonight because I'm willing to take any path that seems possible to get my voice counted and heard in this whole discussion. Signed the petition at the dump, showed up here to say, the Greenbelt path is important to me and to my neighbors. Yes, it's in my own deed to say that I have a right to walk on the Paper Street area of Surfside but it seems to me so much more valuable and so much more important to establish and maintain and protect a broader community resource. And I would ask you also to, at the very least, protect our paper streets from being dissolved or absorbed or abandoned or developed when they are a once in a lifetime opportunity. We can continue to discuss, we can phase in projects, we can work together to try and find a right solution that buffers our shorefront neighbors from any adversarial viewing of their property. It's a little hard for me to understand because the world walks down in front of my house and mostly they wave. But if that's a concern, we can plant a bunch of shrubs. The thing is, we cannot recapture what we give away today. And I would ask you, please, when in doubt, be on the side of the future and protect this town resource. And I thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Cap Jeff Monroe. <clears throat> I'm a resident of 11 Cotton Road. 
in Cape Elizabeth here, and it feels odd to be on this side of the podium for a change. Normally I'm on that side. Um, the whole plan that has been brought forward is about quality of life enhanced by access to the many natural venues that we have as we see our rural nature of our community disappear. Having worked in Boston and Portland, as you all are aware, and 30 communities since then, I found that this plan is probably one of the finest as I've seen. But as a resident of Shore Acres, where 1223 is now proposed, um, we recognize that the trail is going to impact the right of way contained in most of our deeds down in that community, including mine. And I will tell you that most of us who have that in our deeds, most of us that enjoy that right away, are very supportive of Trail 23, and including myself, and putting this Greenbelt plan in place. We think it's important for the community, we think it's important for the neighborhood, and we also think it's important for the future. Having been in public service for 25 years, I've often heard the fears of many people who talk about traffic issues and parking issues, only to see that I would say the vast majority of those fears never come to fruition. I don't believe that those fears will come to fruition here either. Right? But what I do see is that as our community continues to grow and as we see public space erode, that this marvelous plan that has been put together through hundreds of hours of, of very dedicated service by a great deal of people uh, is a very good one. And I think it's the foundation for what we think will be a very enhanced uh, quality of life for all of us who not only live within Cape Elizabeth, but certainly within the Shore Acres area. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else at the podium, I'm ready to close the public hearing. The public hearing is closed. Okay. Item 19, proposed update to the Greenbelt Plan. Uh, I'll just read what it states here. The town council indicated at a recent workshop that following the public hearing, a decision will be deferred to a later meeting. The council will likely table this item to the January 6th meeting. Do I have a motion? Well, or, before okay. we make a motion, I, one of the comments was that there might have been some confusion about what was supposed to happen tonight. Um, I'm looking at our agenda, and I think it's quite clear that a public hearing was set for tonight. Uh, it's too bad if somebody misunderstood that. Um, but certainly between now and next month when we vote, there is ample opportunity to send us emails. We read them all. Uh, if, there anything, if there's anything that hasn't been said yet, it's hard to believe that there is, but if there is anything that hasn't been said yet, you are more than welcome to ship us an email and we'll be happy to read it. Uh, when we take this up, assuming we do this in January, uh, there is always allotted 15 minutes at that time for public comment as well. That's correct. For our council rules. Um, am I getting the hook? Now? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, in terms of paying attention to petitions or not, I think, at least sitting from this perspective, I look at all feedback, whether it's signatures on a petition, emails, uh, public comment. It doesn't really matter who got the most comments in their favor or against them. I'm looking at how people articulate their views on the issue and what, at the end of the day, I think is what's right for our town. So I, I do pay attention to petitions as I pay attention to all public feedback. Um, and it was really nice to hear from Sugaret about her father, Jim. He was a, a gentleman, uh, and uh, it's no surprise to me that he was forward-looking all those years ago. So, anyway. Council Walsh. Um, again, um, I, just, I echo uh, David's point of view, and I think uh, Barbara Freeman's comments about uh, she took advantage of any opportunity to have her voice heard, whatever that meant. And we certainly have gotten everything from phone calls to people at IGA or at the dump, or, you know, believe me, I mean, it, you know, I've heard it, any chance anyone's had to talk with me. But, but I want to give Caitlin Jordan credit for why we've delayed this to January. Caitlin has asked us on more than one occasion when we have a public hearing not to rush to judgment. In this case, there are so many variables, so many issues that we've listened to that Caitlin has asked us to stop and pause and, and really look at the issue again just one more time before you make whatever decision you're going to make. So that's the reason that we're doing this. 
And I know that during the last year, we've had occasions where we've moved forward on something right after a public hearing. And while it may have felt right, it may not have felt right for citizens. It felt like it maybe was decided in a back room or with a smoke-filled room. So I applaud Caitlin's reason at our workshop for wanting to move this to one more month just so that we can be sure the decision we make is the right one for Cape Elizabeth and the right one for the, for the future. So. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Council Wagner. Yeah, I, I heard some discussion. I think it was from uh, Mr. Foley tonight uh, suggesting that there was a history of, of use. And I know that it would be helpful to me in my deliberation to hear more about the history of use by the community of the proposed trail. Because as we consider the, um, the legal implications, um, the case law requires that we look at the history of use. Uh, at least that's my reading of the case law. So I think it'd be appropriate, and, and I appreciate everybody's comment to date, and I'm very familiar with them, but I haven't heard a lot of specifics on the way that it's been used by the community. Hmm. Council Jordan. Also, um, our wonderful attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, but we also heard comments today that we already own the Paper Street, the town, which is my understanding is not correct because we haven't taken the Paper Street to be used as a Paper Street yet. So it's, it's technically not town-owned property as of today. And I'm getting the nod yes. So just to correct any misconceptions that may be floating about. Well, I'd, I'd like to move the question. Um, could I have a motion to uh, on item 19 that we uh, table the item to the January 6th council meeting for a vote? I move that we table this till next month to the January 6th meeting. And I'll second that. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay, unanimous. Okay, item number 20, establishment of a library building committee. As we clear house. Mm. We have a draft building committee in front of us, and um, I'd like to. Do you want to wait a minute? I'm sorry. To, to, no, just to <laughs> select and clear house. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I said we're going to clear Thank house you. now. <laughs> just so ready to move on. Oh, I know, right? Gee, I'm not in any hurry on that. Yeah, I thought it was if you didn't do that, I was going to say it. Yeah, don't no, forget. I had people call me to say, I understand you can make this decision. And I got to be. You see the trucks going on. Yeah, the bump I twice hit with Dean because we had a counselor. Be careful out there. It doesn't look good. Even if you have your homework done right. and you know what you're doing. And so I, I think that, that was where. Bring those boards with you, Jay. Did you bring those boards with you? Some. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. Item number 20, establishment of a library building committee. Uh, again, we have a, a draft committee in front of us, structure of draft committee in front of us. And I'd like to ask uh, Councilor McCausland to just give us a little briefing on this. She was the chairman of the Library Planning Committee, eminently qualified to tell us about this <laughs> structure of this proposed new committee. Well, we'll find out about that. <laughs> so the recommendation is for a small committee of voting members, and that would be comprised of two council members, one member invited from the school board um, and selected by them one trustee from the Thomas Memorial Library and one educated and knowledgeable member of the public who would participate. Uh, the recommendation also includes um, a couple of non-voting members, the library director and the facilities director, as well as a member designated by the school superintendent to advise our committee on certain opportunities and issues. The purpose of the committee will be to implement the plan that was developed this year by the Library Planning Committee, and the committee will develop a building plan within the recommended $4 million budget that will go to the voters for approval at a referendum vote. 
uh, our committee, I think, will be specifically charged with seeking public input. Um, the recommendation also says that the manager will administer the project budget and handle the contractual arrangements with committee recommended architects and with a construction manager. And finally, that the committee chair will update the council regularly on the committee's progress. Thank you. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, in voting members, um, it does state that one voting member shall be appointed by the council chair, and that is former Councilor Frank Governale, is the, the individual that I wish to appoint to this committee. So uh, shall we have a motion on item 20? Can I make that motion? Sure. Yes. So moved that we accept that recommendation. And a second? I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion? Council Wagner? Yeah. I, I just wanted to point out that the way that it's phrased, it says one member to be invited shall be a member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. And I'm assuming that's intentional phraseology because it's, it doesn't mandate that they have to be part of it, but that they should be invited. Correct. Okay. Council Wallet? Um, I just want to, uh, again, compliment uh, Molly and you, Jessica, and, and uh, Michael, for putting together all of these elements that have been presented in front of us here, because there's a considerable amount of time and energy and effort that went into putting some of these pro formas together so we would have something of substance to look at as it relates to the next step. Um, so again, I'm, I'm pleased to have that in front of us. And again, uh, you know, I uh, look forward to the, to the continued work uh, hopefully not 39 meetings in 12 months, but uh, whatever that means. Okay. Just if there was an opportunity for public comment. Ah, okay. Would, somebody in the back wanted to speak. Would you like to address the council on this item? We need your name, address, and you have three minutes. <laughs> Hello, Christopher Straw, 597 Shore Road. And I'll just begin by thanking you all for your service. I realize uh, you do have contentious issues before you. This one hopefully is not one. I just wanted to point out <laughs> one aspect of the proposal, and I wanted to commend you on it, which was that the uh, whatever proposal comes out of the proposed committee be sent to a town referendum by November 2014. I just wanted to commend you for including that. The one aspect I wanted to focus on was the fact that, as you all know, the last uh, referendum, the school or the, the library revisions were voted down. This has been going on for a couple of years. It looks like the idea is that we're going to set aside three or four hundred thousand dollars to put together a plan for a November vote. I don't know if it would be possible to have the vote happen sooner just to get the town to approve or disapprove the four million so the project could move forward quicker. And uh, uh, one last point is that my family is heavy users of the library and we just look forward to eventual resolution one way or the other with whatever's gonna happen with the library. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any more discussion on the council? Do I have a motion? Oh, I have a motion and yes, second it. Do we have uh, all those in favor? Opposed? No, no, it's unanimous. Okay. Item number 21. Uh, members of the Library Building Committee, if the previous item is adopted, and it just was, the Council will need to choose two of its members to serve on the Library Building Committee. The Council may also consider confirmation of the public member to serve, and the incoming chair, as I mentioned, that I'm recommending is Frank Rinaldi. Um So what I think we ought to do is, do we have any volunteers on the Council who would like to serve on the Building Committee? <laughs> Council McCausland? Yes. And Council Walsh? Um, may I have a motion to approve Councilors McCausland and Councilor Walsh? as members, the council representatives no, on the no, committee. No, I was, thought we were voting. Oh. <laughs> I, I move that we approve uh, having Councilors McCausland and Walsh serve on the uh, Library Building Committee. Second it. Frank. And, second. and Frank Governale. Oh, yes, and second. Frank, yes. Yeah. Second. Okay. Good. And Councilor Jordan seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, item number 22. The pre-bid, pre-bonding budget for the library project. So I will turn to the town manager to uh, brief us on the proposal. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. Uh, th this proposal, now that you've formed a building committee, would give the building committee the resources that it needs to develop a library plan to bring it to the point of a bid and so that then in, in a bond vote so that citizens know what they're voting on. Uh, we've gone through the, the different costs, uh, including uh, the architectural fees for the renovation for new construction, what a planning board review would cost, a construction manager during the pre-bid services, the state fire marshal review fees, a little bit of contingency, legal and bonding, and it comes out to $340,810. It's proposed that 100,000 of that be appropriated from the Infrastructure Improvement Fund and 240,810 from uh, the unassigned fund balance. It's also proposed that those monies be repaid if the bond is approved. If the bond is not approved, it would be a sunk cost. And the item also sets an overall project budget of $4 million, excluding furnishings and new technology, which is uh, hoped to be raised uh, privately and it also excludes any reuse of the Spurwink school portion of the current structure. Any questions? Okay. Any discussion, questions for the, before we move to motion? Uh, Councilor Sherman? I'm just uh, responding in part to what Mr. Straw said earlier, and I'm, I'm not sure I followed it all, but I, I think that one concern perhaps he was expressing was that we're budgeting $340,000 to be spent before we actually get to the vote in November. Mm -hmm. And we had a discussion about this at the workshop, and, and, and the reason uh, we're making that investment is we want the voters to be clear about what type of library they're going to be voting on uh, come November. And the way to do that is to have a building committee working with an architect to have clear, concrete <coughs> floor plans so the public knows what this project would look like when it goes to vote in November. <coughs> so that's the rationale for spending this money up front. I think some of the feedback we got from the last vote was people that only were concerned about the price tag of six million of public money plus a few million more of private was they weren't really clear on the concept of what the new library would look like and so this is an effort to try to address that concern. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure we could get to a vote any sooner than November uh, though I trust this committee will work with all due haste. Thank you. Council Jordan. Um, I just wanted to echo that. I was the one who brought that up at our workshop, and I find it to be a true catch-22 situation. I do not believe in spending so much money on a project that's not been voted on and approved, because you're kind of sinking a lot of money into a project and then asking the voters to say yes or no, and if you say yes, great. If you say no, then we've wasted a whole lot of money. And so at the same time, I don't think the library project will move forward without proper plans developed. So I'm not sure that there is a better compromise, but it seems to me unfair to ask the town to spend so much money without having a vote to spend the larger sum of money. So I think a better solution could still be resolved. I just don't know what it is, and everybody seems very concerned with the time frame. So I don't see a different solution being sought out. So. I'm voting against the use of all this money without a, a proper vote. Any other comments? No? We have a motion to accept the uh, pre-bid, pre-bonding budget for the library project as proposed by the town manager. So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Item number 23, Proputa Club Beverage Licenses. I'll ask the uh, town clerk to discuss this, but before we proceed with that, I personally need to disclose that I am a member of the Proputa Club. And do we have any counselors who need to make that disclosure? I also have to disclose that I am a member of the Proputa Club as well. And I, yeah, I don't see any, any problems with it, but again, I'll look to my fellow counselors for how they feel about it. I say the same thing. I don't, I don't feel that there's any conflict, but again, I defer to my fellow counselors. That's fine. Oh, okay. Would the town clerk please uh, 
brief us on this application? Sure, I'd be happy to. You have before you a renewal application for both the liquor licenses, the mall, vinous, and spirituous liquor license, and the special amusement permit for the Papuda Club. Uh, I believe the application to be in order. Uh, being that this is a renewal, a formal public hearing is not required, but certainly if there's any citizen input uh, to the council, that would be welcome. And I believe there's a representative from the Papuda Club here as well. Good evening. My name's Douglas Kaplan. I live at Five Winding Way, and uh, I am a member of the Board of Governors of Perputic and chair the House Committee, which is responsible for the service of liquor at the Perputic Club. And I'm here to answer any questions that anybody may have. Does anyone have questions for Mr. Kaplan? Hmm? What's, your, uh, what's your best scotch you have there? <laughs> I'm not a scotch drinker, but I'm told it's a single malt of some sort. <laughs> How'd I do? <laughs> well, we haven't voted yet. <laughs> you feel the Scotch question. <laughs> well, no other questions for Mr. Kaplan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, approve the Perputa Club Beverage License Renewal? Councilor Sherman? I move that we approve the Perputa Club Beverage Licenses. Second. And Council Wagner seconds. Any more discussion? All those in favor? That's approved. Item 24, the annual acceptance of gifts. Uh, I will again turn to the town clerk to brief us on the gifts that people generously donate to members of our community. Thank you very much. Before you, you do have a list. Uh, various departments of the town uh, have been provided either uh, mostly financial donations, some in-kind donations. They range from the police department, fire department, um, local fuel assistance, uh, the Spurring Church, Greenbelt Trails, the Portland Headlight, uh, and the Thomas Memorial Library. So we thank all those folks for their no donations uh, for 2013. Do I have a motion to accept the gifts to the town? Council Wall? I move that we accept the uh, annual gifts to the town of Cape Elizabeth. Seconded. Councilor Wagner, is there any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Item 25, the Appointments Committee report. I shall turn this over to our new Appointments Committee Chairman, Councilor Jordan. Thank you, Jessica. Chairman Sullivan. Um, yes, yeah, so we had three wonderful evenings of interviews. We had lots of people come out. We greatly appreciate it and want to thank everybody for wanting to serve the community. I have quite a list of names and appointments to go through tonight, so I'll jump right in. We have for the Board of Assessment Review, John Charette. Conservation Commission will be Garvin Dunnigan, Jim Tass, and Zach Matsuit, Matskin, sorry. Fort Williams Advisory Committee will be Chris Char Corbett, Lisa Pratt, Mark Russell, and Terry Ann Scriven. The Personnel Boards of Appeal are uh, still seeking some candidates, so anybody still out there might be interested. Uh, the Planning Board will have Elaine Fallander, Henry Steinberg. Recycling Committee will have Carrie Ann Lavender Law, Peter Fry, and William Schmidt. The Riverside Memorial Cemetery Trustees will be Sharon Marks. Marks. The Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, Ruth Ann Haley, Martha Palmer, and Ken Piper. Zoning Board of Appeals will be Michael Today We, Today we Lent. Zoning Board of Appeals, also Michael Valancourt and Joanna Torengo. And the 250th Anniversary Committee, which we are forming for the first time to plan a wonderful celebration party as the town of Cape Elizabeth turns 250. We will have Catherine Adams, Jane Beckwith, Carol Ann Jordan, Norman Jordan, Stephanie Crump, Darren McClellan, and Barbara Powers. And so I move that we ask the town council to approve the appointees as the appointments committee has recommended. In a second. Councilor McCausland, any discussion? Councilor Walsh. I just, want, I just want to thank the appointments committee for the three nights of, uh, of interviews and also uh, to Deb Lane for all of the advertising and uh, that you had to go through. And I want to thank all these folks in advance for stepping up and providing the time and talent to our community and uh, working on, a, on really some serious work in the next year. 
Thank you. I'd also like to thank Councillor Ray, who very graciously stepped in when oh, yes. one of our appointments committee members had a family emergency so that we didn't have to reschedule a lot of people one evening. That's good. So thank you, Councillor Ray. So uh, do we have a motion to accept our, the committee's report and nominations? We did that. And second. You already we did you already? already? Have it, yeah. yeah. All those in favor? Senate. <laughs> That's unanimous. Okay, uh, item 26, authorization of a quick claim deed. Again, with the town clerk, please tell us about this. I'd be happy to do so. Uh, the property that we're talking about at 15 Scott Dyer Road is a property across from the, uh, the schools. It's, it's a property that's a bit unkept um, at the present time. Um, back in June of 2011, the town filed a, an actual sewer lien against the property. It was that sewer lien that first foreclosed. Um, um, so that's what we're actually talking about is the sewer foreclosure. Subsequent to that, there was a real estate ta tax lien that foreclosed. Um, the family uh, has been given, they've been working with the town manager and they were given approximately a year. Um, it was a year ago that the, um, the lien foreclosed to get their um, uh, things in order. They have provided the town a check for over $16,000 that represents not only the sewer lien, but the real estate taxes from 2011 through 2014. They have asked for that property to be redeemed back uh, to the former owner, which would be Doreen F. Amandi. So uh, the recommendation this evening is for you to authorize the town manager to assign the quick claim deed back to Doreen F. Amandi for property at 15 Scott Dyer Road. Thank you. Do we have a motion? So moved. Council Wagner, and a second? Seconded. Council Walsh, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item 27, Project Canopy Grant Application. I'll ask the town manager to tell us about this application. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. This is a project of the Fort Williams Arboretum, the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. And at the northerly end of the Cliff Walk entrance, there's, there's an area of, uh, that you've seen some brush clearing uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, the Arboretum folks would like to go in there and plant about 207 different plants and trees of a different variety, mostly fairly low. Uh, the grant application uh, is for $7,300, uh, There's some match required. All of these monies would be privately funded. Uh, there'd be no town monies involved, so I, I would encourage you to authorize the application. Do I have a motion? Dr. Councilor Sherman? Uh, I move that we approve the grant application to Project Canopy for the Arboretum at Fort Williams Park. Second. Council Jordan seconds. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item 28, proposed shooting range ordinance. And before we proceed, Council Wagner, would you be so kind as to join the audience while we deliberate on item 28? Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak to this agenda item? If you would, please approach the podium. You have three minutes. And we need your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Eric Frem, and I live at 64 Cross Hill Road. Um, the Spurwink Ride and Gun Club organized itself in a town that already had a municipal gun uh, noise ordinance. And as you prepare to study Mr. Cole's proposed ordinance, I continue to ask for your help in answering this question and the new potential ordinance's impact on it. On what day did this town's disturbance of the peace protections stop applying to us? Put differently, what reasonable reading of the town's ordinances, both zoning and general, should have alerted my neighborhood that Cape Elizabeth's laws simply don't apply to the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club? I hope you've concluded for yourselves by now that the club is not actually grandfathered in from noise laws. Powerful quality of life ordinances predated the existence of the Spurwink Club. The, the legal analyses that you've commissioned um, more recently and also in 1995 may both have wholly ignored them, but it doesn't change the fact that protections from excessive noise have been on the books for at least 72 years in our community. Understandably, you've carved out reasonable exceptions for things like agricultural activities over the years. When did the council rule that this town's loudest and most dangerous recreational activity just isn't subject to our laws? 
I haven't found that you ever did. I think applicable law has simply not been applied, and that strikes me as an executive slip, not a legislative one. The club has functioned as an extra-legal enterprise operating outside the law. Does the status of non-conforming permitted use really confer immunity from any and all regulation? In what other town is that the case? It's not the fault of our neighborhood that the club is too small and too outmoded to contain its noise and vibration and, as an aside, its bullets. It's not our fault that the club doesn't comply with ordinances that were already in effect when it was formed. So I implore you, as you consider making new law, please make the club obey the rules that have been in place for its entire existence. Councillor Jordan, you were quoted in the November 29th Forecaster article saying that the club, quote, has been there forever. As long as it's safe, I don't see any problem with it. Noise is not a safety issue. If you build a house next to a rod and gun club, you're going to hear gunfire in the background. It's kind of a given, end quote. But noise is a noise issue, and noise laws have been on this town's books for at least seven decades. That's not forever, but it's longer than the club has existed. The question isn't, I think, what did you expect when you moved near a gun club? The better question, I think, is what did you expect when you moved into Cape Elizabeth, a town with strong, a strong municipal noise ordinance, a reputation for good governance, and residents who, in the word of your own zoning ordinance, prize the peace and quiet of their residential neighborhoods. Is this what we should have expected? Bullets hitting homes and the selective non-enforcement of noise laws? I don't think that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ed Riley from 3 Chesterwood Road. In you, Cape would Elizabeth. you repeat your name, please? Ed Riley. And I want to thank the town council for uh, the thoughtful consideration of this ordinance and this issue. I know it's been a difficult issue for the town for a long time. I'd just like to speak in favor of the proposed ordinance. I think it's important for a quality of life in Cape Elizabeth, for safety, and for noise. And I thank you for your consideration. Uh, first off, uh, your name and address. My name is uh, Mark Mayon. I live on 94 Mono Road in South Poland. Um, I'd like to say, uh, first off, uh, in response to uh, Councilman Walsh. Excuse me, Mr. Mayon. Yeah. As you are not a citizen of Cape Elizabeth, could you explain to the audience your affiliation here sure. tonight? Sure. I'm the uh, president of Spurwink Run and Gun Club. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, in response to uh, Councilman Walsh's uh, assertion uh, at the very beginning of the meeting, uh, I do deeply appreciate uh, the work that councillors do, and, it, uh, and I can understand the thankless aspect of it, but there are many people out there, uh, myself included, who don't actually have the chutzpah to step up to the plate and actually uh, do the job that you guys do. But uh, thank you. That's, that's the thank you. I don't know if it helps anything. But anyway, here in front of me. Don't use your time for any longer. <laughs> it's all right. Um, in front of me is a uh, letter uh, dated March 27, 1961. Uh, the selectmen of the Cape Elizabeth held a hearing on March 20, 1961, on petition of 10 residents of the town established in uh, of the town to establish a supervised shooting range on your property at Sawyer Road. Uh, as a result of the hearing, the selectmen, before we had counselors, the selectmen have voted to grant a permit for the establishment of such a range to be, in in <coughs> to be conducted in accordance with Section 14, Article 2, Revised Ordinance of 1951 as amended. And it's signed by <coughs> three selectmen and the chief police. We believe that uh, if the town wants to have a ordinance governing firearms ranges or shooting ranges, I think it's a great idea, except our club should be exempted. Uh, we should be grandfathered. Our belief is, is that we should be grandfathered in. Um, with that being said, I wish that uh, this meeting was about six months later than it is right now, Actually, uh, about seven months later than it is right now. Uh, there would be changes 
that are going to occur this summer when the building season occurs that um, would probably help you out with an ordinance as a best, pra as a best practices. Uh, there are going to be quite a few things that the, there's been a, quite a few things the club has already done and we just on Monday, on Tuesday, we just enshrined them into our bylaws as laws. Uh, these are rules that we put in place this year and then finally put them into our constitution. No rapid fire, no mechanical assists of triggers, um, an actual penalty phase uh, where the penalty for a infraction of our rules generally was up to me and I generally had a few months suspension and uh, one year probation. Would you please finish off? Sure. Anyway, those are enshrined in our rules now where they never have before. And uh, we also have a mechanism for new rules, and this is important for the community to realize. These new rules are going to be sent out to every one of our members. Each member has to check off a box that's saying that they've read all the new rules. They have to mail that in with their dues, or their dues don't get renewed. So, again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there any, anyone else want to address this agenda item? Okay. Um, the proposed, uh, uh, excuse me, what this item is proposing is that we forward uh, this range ordinance onto the ordinance committee for review. I, do I have a motion? Councilor Ray. I, I move that we um, have the town council thank Ken Cole for his report and refer it to the ordinance committee for review. Is there a second? I second that. Councilor Walsh, any discussion? Councilor Jordan? Oh, my only thing is a comment to the ordinance committee about um, the noise mitigation that it shall not exceed 65 dBA. If we can get some kind of idea of how much a gunshot is, you know, how loud it generates, so we have something to measure that against. I mean, I don't even know if 65 dBA is reasonable, unreasonable. It's so just a comment with for you <coughs> going forward. That's the only one I saw. It might so I'm not sure I understand. What is your request? In, in, Ken's, uh, in Ken's recommendations, right. he gets into some, some metrics, some measurement, yep. and I think that's what Caitlin is. Right, is, she's just saying is, that. You're asking what that is the equivalent of? Is that what right, you're like, I mean, if, if a, a one single shot is louder than 65, I'm just yeah. throwing that out there, then it seems kind of silly that we set it at 65. I'm just sure. wondering where that number comes from, if it's a reasonable number to put out there for, you know, a standard to be held to a gun club. Sure. Council Walsh. Okay. Just a, a comment uh, for Caitlin that, and again, you know, Kathy's the chair of this committee, but when we were dealing with the short-term rental and I was the chair, any one of us can attend those meetings and it's, it'll be well known what is the subject matter for the particular event. And again, I would encourage if you have mm -hmm. a particular interest that you participate, at least come to the meetings because I think this is, not, this is going to take a while. Um, this is not going to get done quickly. And it, it's going to be a process which is going to be very, very involving of all the parties. So, mm -hmm. But it is a good question, though, definitely. Councilor Sherman? Yeah, I was thinking the president of the gun club may get his wish that it may not be till the yeah. summer that well, uh, yeah. uh, we're finished with the process. But uh, that being said, I, I would also like the or ask the ordinance committee to consider asking the town's attorney uh, to follow up on some of the legal arguments that have been raised by the gentleman, the first gentleman who spoke here tonight, uh, as, as well as to weigh in on the impact of the uh, section that uh, the gun club president had read as well. I, I, we've gotten a lot of communications about that, so it'd be helpful to know whether that impact impacts our, uh, our deliberations. Okay. Um, Jessica. Council Walsh. Um, that, um, the issue that um, was discovered um, was a 1941 um, ordinance. It was uh, discovered in the Historic Society. And uh, Ken Cole has a copy of that. And, um, and I, my understanding is that we're probably going to be utilizing him in our deliberations at the ordinance level and get the answer to the very question that you ask. 
So, good stuff. Okay, Councilor Ray. Well, I would hope that the council would uh, support that the as the ordinance committee needs uh, legal help with some of these issues that we, we would be allowed to continue um, our um, use of Ken Cole mm -hmm. for those issues. Definitely. Yep. Okay. Excuse me. Yes, uh, yes Chairman. So that's my understanding, and uh, you know, until I hear from you further, uh, you you should consider that the expectation is that Mr. Cole will be at any meeting that you choose to invite him to. Thank you. So, all those in favor of referring the proposed shooting range ordinance to the ordinance committee, Councilor. Oh. oh. We're Six, six zero <clears throat> carries. Okay, item 29. Welcome back, Council Wagner. Mm -hmm. Item 29, school bond request, draft motion to thank the, the Cape Elizabeth School Board for its request and refer it to the Finance Committee. Uh, is there a motion? Yeah, I would, I would, you know, I would move that, you know, I would move that the uh, Cape Elizabeth um, Town Council thank the Cape Elizabeth School Board for their request to refer the entire um, request for bonding to the full finance committee of the Town Council. Okay. Is there a second? Se second. Council Chairman, is there any discussion? It's all pretty straightforward and um, Meredith sent out materials in you know, support of the request today. Today, right. Um, so uh, again, we need to, to convene as a group, as a finance committee, and dig into the question that's on the table. Okay. So. Can I ask a question about that? What yes. does that mean for timing? Does that mean we'll be discussing it in January, February, March? It, it could be March. It could be when the finance, my understanding is when the finance committee convenes. Is, Chairman? Well, to follow up on that question, when would we, when would we want to get that referendum for that to approve that bond to the public? Would it be at a, the uh, the spring vote on the school va budget validation vote, or are we talking about uh, the November vote, or we, well, is it to be determined? I think okay, it's to be de determined. Yeah. But their initial thoughts are that they'd like to have it with that school um, budget vote approval. That's at least the original thought process. And again, we haven't had a chance as a finance committee, as a, as a town council body, to review and determine whether that makes sense or not. So that's really the next step for us. So. Mm -hmm. Council Jordan? So can, do we schedule a special finance committee workshop, or can we have a finance committee workshop at a regular town council workshop, I guess, to move it along quicker? It, you know, the scheduling of specific items for workshops and is, you know, I usually work with the council chair, and in this case, I would imagine there'd be a dialogue with the council chair and the finance chair. And, you know, they, they, we do have a workshop scheduled for January 29th, and, you know, at this point, I'm not seeing a whole lot on that agenda, so, you know, that might be a possible. That would be possible. I don't know what the school board's agenda is that night if they're available, so. All right. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Item 30, Town Center Committee status report. Uh, the Town Center Committee is requesting an extension. Um, I will ask Councilor Sherman to uh, tell us about this because we did talk about this at our recent workshop and then after Councilor Sherman tells us about it, perhaps Councilor Wagner can add some comments. But we did hear from Councilor Sherman <coughs> recently, so I'll let him start if that's okay. Uh, sure. Uh, the Town Center Plan Committee uh, began to meet last May uh, of this year, uh, and we have made a great deal of progress. We've had a public input session. We've received completed questionnaires from member of the members of the public, uh, but have found that we are not yet done with our work. Uh, as I meant, pointed out, we didn't begin until May, so if we were to continue our charge and get the requested extension, that would bring us to, I believe, I believe we're asking for June of 2014 to complete our work. That would be approximately one year's worth of meetings. And both Jamie and I agree that that ought to be adequate to complete our work. At today's uh, meeting we had from 4 to 6 o'clock, we actually mapped out a schedule for meetings 
once or twice each month between now and the end of April, and then we'll see where we are. My guess is we'll have a few more meetings after that, but uh, we have made a great deal of progress uh, and expect to be have it done by June, and the sentiment on the committee was unanimous. People did want to continue this work and to have the extra time to finish it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Council Wagner, would you like to add anything? No, I think David encapsulated it well. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there a motion to um, accept the committee's request for extension? Uh, Jessica, oh, I'm sorry. The comment. I'm sorry. You'd like to speak to the agenda item. <laughs> Said, uh, you do good work and thankless work. Um, Could I have your name and address? Uh, John Donnelly, Pearl Street. Um, for those of the, you who know me know that uh, politics is relatively new for me uh, and will remain new for me. My wife takes care of most of that in our house. But I do, um, I, I do own a small business and I sit on many boards um, uh, in my professional life. And when I, when I dip my toe in the water uh, with the Town Planning Commission, uh, I, I was immediately struck by the composition of the board. Um, and and I, I am not thinking that this composition was maliciously manufactured. But um, Paul Seidman, I know, wrote an email to everybody today um, but we, we've got a, a, a commission that's charged with looking at town center <clears throat> development um, composed of two town council members, very pro-development town council members, um, uh, one on the planning board for six years and, and very, Dave, I think you were very vocal with uh, and a proponent of the of the uh, library, which I, I think is a great in the second rendition is a great uh, where it's at now is going to be fabulous. Jamie, obviously you own a business in town. Um, you said in the in the public forum that I almost didn't move to Cape Elizabeth because the town center was not a vibrant. And, and you are completely and utterly entitled to, to that opinion, but, but really as a citizen. Once you put your, um, and, and I think you know this, but I, I think as we move around in, in, in various committees, it can get lost. Once you put the town councilor hat on as a representative on the commission, that agenda can't be forwarded. Um, and I, I'm not saying you're doing that. I've only been to a couple of meetings. Um, but there's two developers on, you know, one who has been developing much of Cape Elizabeth, uh, the other who has a business in Cape Elizabeth, um, and then really two town planners. The chair is a, is, works in town planning in Portland and, and Maureen. When, and, you know, I, I get it. Now, Maureen, in one of the public... Um, uh, sessions, committee sessions, said this town doesn't, um, doesn't like development and it isn't interested in growing business. That's a very, uh, I think that's a very true statement to some extent. Uh, and I think that's a very tough spot for a town planner to be in if that's what she thinks. And it's a bit like being the Maytag repairman to be the town planner in Cape Elizabeth, I think, with that sentiment. And I think she's completely right. She's completely right, and, and the critical insights from 2005 and 2012, which I think all of you are familiar with, and I, I'll read the perceived importance of potential Cape Elizabeth goals. Top three, protecting and preserving wetlands, ponds, and wooded areas, preserving the town's rural character, protecting farmland. Bottom three, encouraging the development of affordable housing, encouraging the uh, no, I'm sorry, encouraging the development of, of housing type, a, a variety of housing types, improving the town center, and attracting new commercial development. Those were the bottom three. 2012, it was done again exactly the same. If you could finish up, Mr. I Bradley. will. There was um, a survey that went out 
Several people filled it out, said the same thing. Uh, even six or eight people who were interviewed for the Cape Courier pretty much said the same thing. So my question is this. Why are, are we moving forward with a commission, uh, a committee uh, of very potentially incentivized people that make up the committee to uh, further something that the town has said over and over that they're not in favor of. Thank you very much. Okay. Nope. Do I have a motion to <laughs> to uh, accept the committee's request for an extension to June 2014? Uh, yeah, I make that motion to okay. uh, accept the committee's request uh, as set forth in the materials. And did we have a second? I don't know. I'll second. Um, Council Wagner seconds. Okay, any discussion? Yeah, Councilor Sherman? Yeah, I, I, the, the goal and the charge of this committee has been to update the town center plan that dates back to 1993. That is what the con committee is continuing to do. Um, I, there has been some controversy surrounding what this committee ha uh, has considered. Uh, I, in, at the end of the day, I think we've had a lot of good discussions. I think there is a, a variety of opinion on this committee. I, I served in the planning board. I'm not a developer. I have no financial stake in the town center. Uh, so I disagree with uh, uh, John's comments. That being said, uh, you know, ultimately this committee is advisory only. Uh, the town council, when, we get the, when it gets the report in June, can either decide to move forward or not with those recommendations. So uh, the committee has a lot less power, frankly, than I think uh, some mm -hmm. folks believe we have. Thank you. Council Wagner, would you like to address? The oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I appreciate John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate John's comments, and you know, I take them seriously. Um, I, I can only speak for myself uh, because I'm only inside my own head. But I know that I don't act from any sort of incentives other than to serve Cape Elizabeth uh, and to provide the townspeople with what I would consider a nicer place to live. <clears throat> any other comments? Council Walsh. Well, I mean, if you consider John's comments and then you take Paul's um, email to our, us, that wasn't the first time Paul's written to us over the last several uh, weeks or whatever. That is true. I mean, I, I just wonder if the, if the committee ought to, um, instead of asking for more time, maybe consider those public inputs and figure out if either you have to, you know, redirect your charge or re rethink the charge or I. I you know, I mean, it, there are pieces to the, the plan, the original town center plan, that were never implemented. Um, so maybe there's a, there's a place for that in terms of reestablishing maybe a town center committee, a standing committee in, as part of government. I don't know. I mean, I'm just wondering. I mean, you've got three, three data points now that are all saying that it, it, there's a concern. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, I... Look, uh, you know, I tried to buy the lot next door, and 11 years ago, you would have had a building there right now if I had gotten my way through the town council. So, you know, and if I had been on that committee, I would have been considered a developer as well, um, even though, you know, I'm not doing anything right now. So I just wonder about some of this input from these, the two, two notes from Paul and John's comments this evening, but whether this is, this is the right solution by extending. That's all. Councilor Sherman. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if anybody needs to re-examine that issue, it's frankly this, this yep. council, because the town council, uh, this, the town center plan committee charge was approved by the town council, mm -hmm. and the town council specifically said that the committee shall consist of these following individuals. Mm -hmm. One shall be a town center business owner, one a resident of the town center or an adjacent neighborhood, uh, two members uh, from the council itself, a member of the planning board, a member of the school board, uh, it, it was intentional on the council's part to have the committee comprise of individuals with a direct interest in the town center. If that was a mistake, then I don't think it's up to our committee mm -hmm. uh, to address that. I think uh, we did, we've had a discussion about the issue a couple of times, uh, especially in light of uh, a former council member's comments that everybody in that group would have to recuse themselves if they were serving on the council. But Again, I come back to the point that this is an advisory group. Uh, we're all well aware 
that Jamie Wagner has a business in the town center. We're well aware that Skip Murray owns property in the town center. We were well aware that the former school board member lived in the town center. We all knew that, and it's, in, in my opinion, made the committee's deliberations better and more robust. Um, and th these folks have worked awfully hard. I have my notebook here of all the minutes, uh, public comments, et cetera, and I just would really hate to stop this committee's work when we're sort of two-thirds of the way there. I think we can recognize the potential for conflicts, and to the extent anybody feels that's an issue in the report, we can, we can, we can do our best to point that out, okay. or members of the public can. Council Jordan? I was just going to echo Dave's sentiments about it is an advisory committee, and the council does not have to act on anything that we receive from them, but I am definitely very curious to see what comes forward. I mean, an update has to be done. The last update was 1993, so if things are going to change. Maybe things aren't going to change, but I don't see any harm in letting the committee finish their charge. Any other comment, Council Wagner? Yeah, uh, Dave and I were at the uh, Town Center Planning Committee today from 4 to 6, and we finished going through the 37 recommendations from the 1993, which we spent the last two times going through. <clears throat> and uh, we've updated some of those, we've struck some of those, and we're going to come back to the Council with recommendations. Uh, we also are pouring through, and we've gone through the comments from 80-plus survey uh, respondents in a lot of categories, and we uh, decided we're going to deliberate further on those because there's a lot of material, a lot of data that's contained in those. Um, but Jim, to your point of like what we've learned so far, what we've learned is there's a tremendous a lot of difference of opinion. And in fact, I, the way I see it is that there's two, two camps, uh, essentially people that like it just the way it is and people that like to uh, increase a little bit of commercial activity in there, not, not to make it South Portland. Or, Scarborough, but just a little something more, and to uh, consider what our options are. But uh, people are open to it. They want sidewalks in the town center. They want to reduce the speed limit. They've talked about more restaurants, maybe a couple shops. So uh, there's a lot of sentiments on both sides. Anyone else? Councilor Ray. Um, uh, you know, I think that the, the town council um, put together this committee, and I always try to remind myself that we're all volunteers, um, as are the committee members. And we've given them a charge, and if they need a little more time to finish their charge, then I see no harm in letting them do that. So I will support um, the additional time. Council McCausland, did you want to speak? Do we need to think about uh, broadening the membership of that committee? Do you need some other participants who have less specific interest or or less specific experience in, let's say, in real estate or in business? We actually talked about that issue today because mm -hmm. the, the, the representative of the school board finished her term on the school board and decided to resign from our committee. We are going to ask the school board if it wishes to appoint a new school board member. Uh, I, I think the challenge for that person, if he or she joins us, or even going out and getting more members, is we're two-thirds of the way through. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think we need to let this committee finish its charge report back to the council in May. And, you know, it, with all due respect to the commentator tonight and a few folks who have written to us, it, it's coming from a relatively small group of people. Uh, I, I don't think that there's this uh, such of a damaging conflict issue here that we can't proceed. And as I mentioned in response to Jim's comment, this is how the council set it up, uh, clearly with this, with this membership. So I. I think it'd be awfully hard to have new folks join us. I mean, I, I'm not going to fall on a sword over this. If it's the will of the council to appoint a few new folks, we can do that. I just, I don't want that to slow us down because even though the committee remains energetic and committed, I also think they're getting tired and they'd like to, to complete their work. Any other comments? I would like to say that I, I would hope the committee would, first of all, see what the school board does. You know, and if you feel at that point, say they do not provide a replacement, then maybe you can revisit bringing one other member in possibly. But I certainly understand that that could be difficult at this juncture. I think that um, I'll be supporting the motion because the committee did in fact not meet until May. They haven't had a full year. 
I think that the committee in general should be allowed to process through its business and explore everything. And they, it, again, it's advisory only. They'll pre present us with their recommendations. We'll have workshops. We'll have a hearing. We'll have plenty of opportunity to review everything. There'll be plenty of opportunities for comment, but I'm certainly in favor of letting them finish their job. I think it's reasonable to let them go till June, given they never started until May. And, you know, like many things, um, people, various citizens do get focused on pieces of the pie, but I think we can wait to see what the final presentation is in its entirety. So I'll be supporting the motion. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 31, Fort Williams Park Arboretum Children's Garden. Uh, would the town manager please tell us about this? Yes, the, uh, again, the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation, the Arboretum at Fort Williams Park are continuing planning on the children's garden. Uh, they've had plans recently reviewed by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, those were attached and part of your meeting materials for this evening. Uh, it, it does seem as though you know, this is a, in a different part of the park than the current Arboretum uh, sites. So I think it's very important that the council have a familiarity with it. It's proposed that this be referred to a future workshop meeting, and that will not be the January 29th meeting because they have a conflict on that particular evening, but uh, okay. it'll probably be in February sometime if you approve this item. Okay. Um, do we have a motion to approve this? Uh, proposal and forward it to a workshop meeting. Some Council moves. Walsh? Some second. Moves. Council Jordan seconds. Is there any discussion? Well, I think it's pretty exciting, but I, I certainly want to review this at a workshop mm -hmm. because it is another change to Fort Williams, but it looks like a very exciting one. So all those in favor? It's unanimous. Item 32, Town Manager Evaluation Process. I'll go ahead and speak to this. Um, as you know, it's something we've been working on, and um, we'd like to bring it to closure at a future workshop meeting. Um, we had a restructuring the town of the Town Manager's Evaluation, um, but as an interim step, we want to begin the process, and I'll let Mike speak to that just a little bit. Uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. Uh, yeah, I've worked quite a bit, particularly over the summer, with, uh, with Jessica, uh, when she wasn't yet Chairman Sullivan, uh, <laughs> on, uh, on this process. And other communities now, they ask the different department heads to fill out forms or do whatever. We, we particularly looked at the Amith example. And it, it seemed like a good experiment to see how it works. They had a particularly, looked like a particularly good survey instrument. We've revised it some. Mm -hmm. uh, and the plan would be that uh, you would, uh, those would all be summarized by someone and that they'd actually be a representative from the department heads that would come meet with you right. uh, to update you on their feelings, uh, whatever. It's, it's, I think it's healthier, more robust than it's usually been. I think it, it's worth giving a try. Mm -hmm. And the, the, one of the, the biggest changes is essentially a 360 review so that managers direct reports would be reporting to us. And so that, that's something new. And, um, and, and, and again, um, updates it as to more of a sort of a best practices that are hap that's happening in other communities. So um, may I have a motion to uh, refer this to a future workshop? So moved. Councilor Sherman. Seconded. Also, Walt, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Item 33, FEMA flood maps update with the town manager. Please tell us about our flood maps. Yes, there's a written report with the council materials. It's also uh, online. And under the, some of you may have read in other communities, this is quite an issue. In Cape Elizabeth, uh, the code enforcement officer, Ben McDougall, is continuing to look at it. There'll be notices going out tomorrow to 34 properties in town uh, that, are, that have a structure that is being added to the floodplain uh, uh, at the desire of the FEMA. Uh, 13 of them are in the Alewife Cove area. There's a few in Pond Cove, which is not the center of town. It's 
where Pond Cove actually is, particularly as you look across at the point there. There's a few in Maiden Cove uh, at a few low-lying areas there, and the rest are dispersed around the town. Mm -hmm. So wanted to, particularly since it is getting a lot of attention in other communities, wanted you to see Ben's report and know that he's continuing to work on it, attending meetings, we're still working with Bob Gerber, the consultant. Uh, but most of what they seem to be doing, there may be some exceptions, seems to be reasonable and uh, accurate. There are a few properties we are left scratching our heads. Um. Is there a motion to acknowledge receipt of this written update of the FEMA flood maps? Council Walsh. So moved. Is there a second? Council Wagner? Any discussion? Any questions for the town manager? No? Seeing none? All those in favor? It's unanimous. We now have an opportunity for citizens to discuss an item that's any item that's not on tonight's agenda. No one is interested in doing that. So, may I have a motion to adjourn? Moved. Councilor Wagner? Second. Councilor Sherman, second. All those in favor? So, the next scheduled council meeting is January 6, 2014. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.